scripture lesson for today is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 33 through 43. Luke 23, 33 through 43. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Two views from the cross. Bookended by two criminals on Calvary's desperate hill, the violent sounds of mocking were constant, harsh, and shrill. In between the two, an innocent was suffering for the lost. The sweat, the blood, the heartache, a portrait of love's cost. When the bookends looked upon him, they saw with different eyes, one only wanted rescue, and disappointed, he despised. The other looked at Jesus from a different view, and even from his painful perch, all things became brand new. Two criminals hung beside him at the skull that fateful day. One bitterly rejected him, the other found the way. And as the scene unfolded, I bent my head and knee, convicted by both sin and love at the foot of Calvary's tree. It is Christ the King Sunday. It is also the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And here at HUMC, uh, for the last couple of years, we have also blended into this Sunday a celebration of the laity, a celebration of how we have come to know the moving of the Lord in the body of Christ, the church, specifically how we've experienced here at HUMC. So we have three things we're thinking about today, and I promise I won't keep you here three times as long, so don't fret. When we think about Christ the King Sunday, we have this very interesting text that I just read for you this morning, the crucifixion. We 
Probably didn't come thinking we were having a crucifixion scripture this morning. It sounds a little bit different perhaps today in this season. This is uh, the final Sunday of the church worship year. If you follow the liturgical worship year and we follow that rhythm, Christ the King Sunday is always the 52nd of 52 Sundays. Next Sunday, it's the first Sunday of Advent. We begin a whole new cycle But today, we bring a year to the close with this exclamation point, Christ the King. And so this text that we have this morning is the suggested reading for this day, this Christ the King Sunday. I guess we shouldn't be too surprised because there is the sign over the cross. This is the King of the Jews. Of course, it's not given as a sense of honor here. It's a sense of degradation and humiliation and shame, mocking and Jeering, that's the scene before us. The leaders mock Jesus. If you are the Messiah, the chosen one, save yourself. The soldiers also giving the sour wine. If, if you are the king of the Jews, come down, save yourself. And one of the two criminals, save yourself and us if you are the Messiah. It's only in Luke's gospel that we have the, uh, the repentant thief on the cross or the criminal Whenever they're mentioned, the other people who are uh, crucified with Jesus, wherever they're mentioned in the other Gospels, if they're mentioned having any interaction at all with Jesus, they're both deriding him and mocking him. It's only in Luke's Gospel that we have one criminal of the two who says, wait a minute, we're getting what we deserve. This man is innocent. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He acknowledged that Jesus indeed was a king, not the kind of king that... Uh, Anybody in the area that day were recognizing really as a king. They were saying it in a laughable, mocking way. And then those beautiful words of Jesus that we've often found comfort in over the years. Today you will be with me in paradise. It is this kingship piece that I want to invite us to reflect upon for just a moment in our context of worship this morning. Even though we know Christ as king, we could certainly understand why there would be jeering, perhaps, in that scene that we just read about a moment ago. Because surely this is no way to treat a king. Historians tell us that one of the things we learn about Roman execution, not only was it very painful, as you might imagine, but it was humiliating. Part of the deterrent it was supposed to offer was the great humiliation. It was a It was a great public event. People came and and saw uh, the crucified hanging there naked and laying in there for hours and they were being mocked and jeered. And so it was was a tremendously uh, humiliating way to die, long, slow, and suffering and humiliating. Not the kind of death you would prescribe for anyone of a heroic nature, certainly not a king. Some historians tell us that that generally the people who were crucified were those folks who were on the lower end of society, slaves, and those folks who were uh, on the bottom of life's heap. It's not the kind of place that royalty would be placed. And so you can imagine how it would be laughable in that setting to look upon one who is being crucified with the claim of kingship. It would be the the response that would be natural to laugh at that and to jeer and and to make fun. And yet here we are looking at this text being reminded again that this is our very unusual king. Martin Luther who uh, uh, gave us uh, in the life of the church of course the the, the figurehead of the Protestant Reformation back in the 16th century and, and a lot of his reflections, his theology of the cross have informed our thinking in the life of the cross I've been working on this thesis project around, around the cross, and, and the more I work on this, the more I am reminded of this reality that there are so many different ways of understanding the cross that are found in the New Testament. There's not one particular way of understanding a theory of atonement, but Martin Luther had a very interesting idea that I find helpful. Martin Luther drew upon that text that was back in the book of Exodus, where you may remember the story, God is going to pass by Moses... And he tells Moses that he can't look upon him fully, so he's going to put him in the cleft of this rock, and he can only see God's backside as he passes by. He only gets a partial glimpse of God because he cannot see the fullness of God. No mortal can. Martin Luther saw that as formative in his understanding of the cross. Luther would argue that 
that God is most fully revealed through the cross. And yet he is revealed in a partial way, a hidden way. He's revealed in a way that defies all human logic. Every understanding we would have of power and might and wisdom is antithetical to the cross. This God who shocks us. This God who dies. This God who comes in a work of salvation, a redemptive work. This God who upends everything we believe to be true about power and wisdom in the world. It is a shocking display. It's no wonder they were mocking and jeering at the thought of him being a king. And yet what they, what they mocked and jeered is the very thing we proclaim. It is, the, it is the very thing we affirm today on Christ the King Sunday. They, they were right. He is the king. They were laughing as they said it, but he is indeed the king. He ushered in a kingdom, not of this world. He inaugurated a kingdom that continues to grow and will one day come in its fullness upon his return. A kingdom that is very different from the kingdoms of the world that flies in the face of worldly power, worldly wisdom. And we are called into this unusual kingdom, this peculiar kingdom by this unusual and peculiar king. As I journey into my own theology of understanding the cross, I am continually reminded of the mystery of it all. That God's love is always beyond our ability to understand or comprehend or proclaim. And yet we receive simply by faith. So today I simply invite you into this mystery of Christ the King, this King who calls us to live a particular way in the world, in a way that oftentimes is called to defy the world's logic. This kingdom where the currency is justice and compassion and mercy. This kingdom that calls us outside of ourselves, in fact, calls us to die to ourselves so that we can live to the fullness of God's glory. Christ the King Sunday invites us to live more fully into this kingdom that Christ has brought under the kingship and lordship of Christ. Now, Martin Luther believed that, that God was most fully revealed in the cross, and we would certainly affirm that in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus with the cross as the apex. We also could recognize that God continues to be revealed in the world today through the body of Christ, the church. I mentioned that we had three things we're, we're celebrating today. One, Christ the King Sunday. And we look at the mystery of the cross to sort of enter into this, this time, this call to the living to the kingship, to the kingdom of Christ. Now I want to simply pivot us for a few moments in thinking about how we have come to know the goodness of God revealed through the life of the church, the body of Christ in the world today. Laity Sunday, we, we speak of laity as those folks who are not standing in pulpits on Sunday morning, uh, comes from a Greek word laos, which simply literally means people, but we have come to interpret it when we speak of the laity in the life of the church as the people of God. I want to share with you as we enter in just a, a, a word of tribute, a pastoral poem of gratitude and recognition of Laity Sunday, and then I'm actually going to invite a few folks to join with me in a few moments of reflection. To the laos, the laity. To that quiet saint who, while not craving attention, cares deeply that what needs to get done gets done and then does it. To that gracious spirit who is quick with a word of encouragement and kindness, swift with understanding and compassion, who has helped many a weary pastor feel that the pastoral work is valued and has not gone unnoticed or unappreciated. To that voice of reason who is open to consider another view, a differing opinion, who will not participate in nor stomach a divisive, unhealthy, unchristlike, toxic tongue, and who refuses to tolerate gossip in all of its seductive, hellish forms. To the child of God who is committed to do no harm, to do good, to love God and neighbor in all things, at all times, in all ways. To the layperson who does good to as many as possible, as often as possible, in as many ways as possible. To the one who loves deeply, unconditionally and patiently, the one whose witness is genuine and authentic, 
to the one whose discipleship continues to grow and mature. I salute you. I give thanks to God for you. You are the church.